stolen legacy. Greek philosophy is stolen Egyptian philosophy by George G. M. James. Copyright 1954. Introduction Characteristics of Greek Philosophy The term Greek philosophy to begin with is a misnomer, for there is no such philosophy in existence. The ancient Egyptians had developed a very complex religious system called the Mysteries, which was also the first system of salvation. As such, it regarded the human body as a prison house of the soul, which could be liberated from its bodily impediments through the disciplines of the arts and sciences, and advanced from the level of a mortal to that of a god. This was the notion of the summum bonum or greatest good to which all men must aspire and it also became the basis of all ethical concepts. The Egyptian mystery system was also a secret order and membership was gained by initiation and a pledge to secrecy. The teaching was graded and delivered orally to the neophyte and under these circumstances of secrecy, the Egyptians developed secret systems of writing and teaching, and forbade their initiates from writing what they had learnt. After nearly 5,000 years of prohibition against the Greeks, they were permitted to enter Egypt for the purpose of their education first through the Persian invasion and secondly through the invasion of Alexander the Great. From the 6th century BC therefore to the death of Aristotle 322 BC the Greeks made the best of their chance to learn all they could about Egyptian culture. Most students received instructions directly from the Egyptian priests, but after the invasion by Alexander the Great, the royal temples and libraries were plundered and pillaged, and Aristotle's school converted the library at Alexander into a research center. There is no wonder then that the production of the unusually large number of books ascribed to Aristotle has proved a physical impossibility for any single man within a lifetime. The history of Aristotle's life has done him far more harm than good since it carefully avoids any statement relating to his visit to Egypt, either on his own account or in company with Alexander the Great, when he invaded Egypt. This silence of history at once throws doubt upon the life and achievements of Aristotle. He is said to have spent twenty years under the tutorship of Plato, who is regarded as a philosopher, yet he graduated as the greatest of scientists of antiquity. Two questions might be asked. A. How could Plato teach Aristotle what he himself did not know? B. Why should Aristotle spend twenty years under a teacher from whom he could learn nothing. This bit of history sounds incredible. Again, in order to avoid suspicion over the extraordinary number of books ascribed to Aristotle, 
History tells us that Alexander the Great gave him a large sum of money to get the books. Here again the history sounds incredible, and three statements must here be made. A. In order to purchase books on science, they must have been in circulation so as to enable Aristotle to secure them. B. If the books were in circulation before Aristotle purchased them, and since he is not supposed to have visited Egypt at all, then the books in question must have been circulated among Greek philosophers. C. If circulated among Greek philosophers, then we would expect the subject matter of such books to have been known before Aristotle's time, and consequently he could not be credited either with producing them or introducing new ideas of science. Another point of considerable interest to be accounted for was the attitude of the Athenian government toward this so-called Greek philosophy, which it regarded as foreign in origin and treated it accordingly. Only a brief study of history is necessary to show that Greek philosophers were undesirable citizens, who throughout the period of their investigations were victims of relentless persecution at the hands of the Athenian government. Anaxagoras was imprisoned and exiled, Socrates was executed, Plato was sold into slavery, and Aristotle was indicted and exiled, while the earliest of them all, Pythagoras, was expelled from Croton in Italy. Can we imagine the Greeks making such an about turn as to claim the very teachings which they had at first persecuted and openly rejected? Certainly they knew they were usurping what they had never produced, and as we enter step by step into our study, the greater do we discover evidence which leads us to the conclusion that Greek philosophers were not the authors of Greek philosophy, but the Egyptian priest and hierophants. Aristotle died in 322 BC. Not many years after he had been aided by Alexander the Great to secure the largest quantity of scientific books from the royal libraries and temples of Egypt, in spite, however, of such great intellectual treasure, the death of Aristotle marked the death of philosophy among the Greeks, who did not seem to possess the natural ability to advance these sciences. Consequently, history informs us that the Greeks were forced to make a study of ethics, which they also borrowed from the Egyptian summum bonum or greatest good. The two other Athenian philosophers must be mentioned here, I mean Socrates and Plato, who also became famous in history as philosophers and great thinkers. Every schoolboy believes that when he hears or reads the command, Know thyself, he is hearing or reading words which were uttered by Socrates. But the truth is that the Egyptian temples carried inscriptions on the outside addressed to neophytes, and among them was the injunction, Know thyself. Socrates copied these words from the Egyptian temples, and was not the author. All mystery temples, inside and outside of Egypt, carried such inscriptions, just like the weekly bulletins of our modern churches. Similarly, every schoolboy believes that when he hears or reads the names of the four cardinal virtues, he is hearing or reading names of virtues determined by Plato. Nothing has been more misleading, for the Egyptian mystery system contained 
ten virtues, and from this source Plato copied what have been called the four cardinal virtues, justice, wisdom, temperance, and courage. It is indeed surprising how, for centuries, the Greeks have been praised by the Western world for intellectual accomplishments which belong, without a doubt, to the Egyptians or the peoples of North Africa. Another noticeable characteristic of Greek philosophy is the fact that most of the Greek philosophers used the teaching of Pythagoras as their model, and consequently they have introduced nothing new in the field of philosophy. Included in the Pythagorean theorem, we find the doctrines of A. Opposites B. Harmony C. Fire D. Mind, since it is composed of fire atoms E. Immortality, expressed as transmigration of souls F. The summum bonum, or the purpose of philosophy and these, of course, are reflected in the systems of Heraclitus, Parmenides, Democritus, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. The next thing that is peculiar about Greek philosophy is its use in literature. The Egyptian mystery system was the first secret order of history and the publication of its teachings was strictly prohibited. This explains why initiates like Socrates did not commit to writing their philosophy and why the Babylonians and Chaldeans who were very closely associated with them also refrained from publishing those teachings. We can at once see how easy it was for an ambitious and even envious nation to claim a body of unwritten knowledge which would make them great in the eyes of the primitive world. The absurdity, however, is easily recognized when we remember that the Greek language was used to translate several systems of teachings which the Greeks could not succeed in claiming. Such were the translation of Hebrew scriptures into Greek, called the Septuagint, and the translation of the Christian Gospels, Acts, and the Epistles in Greek, still called the Greek New Testament. It is only the unwritten philosophy of the Egyptians translated into Greek that has met with such an unhappy fate, a legacy stolen by the Greeks. On account of reasons already given, I have been compelled to handle the subject matter of this book in the way it has been handled, namely, a. with a frequency of repetition, because it is the method of Greek philosophy to use a common principle to explain several different doctrines, and b. the quotation and analysis of doctrines, because it is the object of this book to establish the Egyptian origin, and this cannot be so satisfactorily done if the doctrines are not presented. Greek philosophy is somewhat of a drama, whose chief actors were Alexander the Great, Aristotle and his successors in the Peripatetic school, and the Roman Emperor Justinian. Alexander invaded Egypt and captured the royal library at Alexandria and plundered it. Aristotle made a library of his own with plundered books while his school occupied the building and used it as a research center. Finally, Justinian, the Roman Emperor, abolished the temples and schools of philosophy, i.e. another name for the Egyptian mysteries which the Greeks claimed as their product, and on account of which they have been falsely praised and honored for centuries by the world as its greatest philosophers and thinkers. This contribution to civilization 
was really and truly made by the Egyptians and the African continent, but not by the Greeks or the European continent. We sometimes wonder why the people of African descent find themselves in such a social plight as they do. But the answer is plain enough. Had it not been for this drama of Greek philosophy and its actors, the African continent would have had a different reputation and would have enjoyed a status of respect among the nations of the world. This unfortunate position of the African continent and its peoples appears to be the result of misrepresentation upon which the structure of race prejudice has been built, i.e. the historical world opinion that the African continent is backward, that its people are backward, and that their civilization is also backward. Finally, the dishonesty in the movement of the publication of a Greek philosophy becomes very glaring when we refer to the fact, purposely, that by calling the theorem of the square on the hypotenuse the Pythagorean theorem, it has concealed the truth for centuries from the world, who ought to know that the Egyptians taught Pythagoras and the Greeks what mathematics they knew. I want to mention here that among the many books which I found helpful in my present work are The Intellectual Adventure of Man and The Egyptian Religion by Professor Henri Frankfurt and The Mediterranean World in Ancient Times by Professor Eva Sanford. George G. M. James The Aims of the Book The aim of the book is to establish better race relations in the world by revealing a fundamental truth concerning the contribution of the African continent to civilization. It must be borne in mind that the first lesson in the humanities is to make a people aware of their contribution to civilization and the second lesson is to teach them about other civilizations. By this dissemination of the truth about the civilization of individual peoples, a better understanding among them and a proper appraisal of each other should follow. This notion is based upon the notion of the great master mind. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Consequently, the book is an attempt to show that the true authors of Greek philosophy were not the Greeks, but the people of North Africa, commonly called the Egyptians. And the praise and honor falsely given to the Greeks for centuries belonged to the people of North Africa, and therefore to the African continent. Consequently, this theft of the African legacy by the Greeks led to the erroneous world opinion that the African continent has made no contribution to civilization and that its people are naturally backward. This is the misrepresentation that has become the basis of race prejudice which has affected all people of color. For centuries, the world has been misled about the original source of the arts and sciences. For centuries, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle have been falsely idolized as models of intellectual greatness. And for centuries, the African continent has been called the Dark Continent because Europe coveted the honor of transmitting to the world the arts and sciences. I am happy to be able to bring this information to the attention of the world, so that on the one hand all races and creeds might know the truth and free themselves from the prejudices which have corrupted human relations, and on the other hand that the people of African origin might be emancipated from their serfdom 
of inferiority complex and enter upon a new era of freedom in which they would feel like free men with full human rights and privileges. Part 1 Chapter 1 Greek philosophy is stolen Egyptian philosophy. 1. The teachings of the Egyptian mysteries reached other lands many centuries before it reached Athens. According to history, Pythagoras, after receiving his training in Egypt, returned to his native island, Samos, where he established his order for a short time, after which he migrated to Croton, 540 BC, in southern Italy, where his order grew to enormous proportions, until his final expulsion from that country. We are also told that Thales, 640 BC, who had also received his education in Egypt and his associates, Anaximander and Anaximenes, were natives of Ionia in Asia Minor, which was a stronghold of the Egyptian mystery schools, which they carried on. Sanford's The Mediterranean World, page 195 to 205. Similarly, we are told that Xenophanes, 576 BC, Parmenides, Zeno, and Melissus were also natives of Ionia, and that they migrated to Elia in Italy and established themselves and spread the teachings of the mysteries. In like manner, we are also informed that Heraclitus, 530 BC, and Pedocles, Anaxagoras, and Democritus were also natives of Ionia, who were interested in physics. Hence, in tracing the course of the so-called Greek philosophy, we find that Ionian students, after obtaining their education from the Egyptian priests, returned to their native land, while some of them migrated to different parts of Italy where they established themselves. Consequently, history makes it clear that the surrounding neighbors of Egypt had all become familiar with the teachings of Egyptian mysteries many centuries before the Athenians who, in 399 B.C., sentenced Socrates to death. Zeller's History, page 112, 127, 170 to 172, and subsequently caused Plato and Aristotle to flee for their lives from Athens because philosophy was something foreign and unknown to them. For this same reason, we would expect either the Ionians or the Italians to exert their prior claim to philosophy, since it made contact with them long before it did with the Athenians, who were also its greatest enemies, until Alexander's conquest of Egypt, which provided for Aristotle free access to the Library of Alexandria. The Ionians and Italians made no attempt to claim the authorship of philosophy, because they were well aware that the Egyptians were the true authors. On the other hand, after the death of Aristotle, his Athenian pupils, without the authority of the state, undertook to compile a history of philosophy recognized at the time as the Sophia or wisdom of the Egyptians, which had become current and traditional in the ancient world, which compilation, because it was produced by pupils who had belonged to Aristotle's school. Later history has erroneously called Greek philosophy, in spite of the fact that the Greeks were its greatest enemies and persecutors, and had persistently 
treated it as a foreign innovation. For this reason, the so-called Greek philosophy is stolen Egyptian philosophy, which first spread to Ionia, thence to Italy, and thence to Athens. And it must be remembered that at this remote period of Greek history, i.e. Thales to Aristotle, 640 B.C. to 322 B.C., the Ionians were not Greek citizens, but at first Egyptian subjects and later Persian subjects. Zeller's History Page 37, 46, 58, 66 to 83, 112, 127, 170, 172. William Turner's History Page 34, 39, 45, 53. Rogers Student History Page 15. B.D. Alexander's History Page 13, 21. Sanford's The Mediterranean World Page 157, 195 to 205. A brief sketch of the ancient Egyptian Empire would also make it clear that Asia Minor or Ionia was the ancient land of the Hittites, who were not known by any other name in ancient days. According to Diodorus and Manetho, high priest in Egypt, two columns were found at Nysa, Arabia, one of the goddess Isis and the other of the god Osiris on the latter of which the god declared that he had led an army into India to the sources of the Danube and as far as the ocean. This means of course that the Egyptian Empire at a very early date included not only the islands of the Aegean Sea and Ionia but also extended to the extremities of the east. We are also informed that Senusert I during the 12th dynasty, i.e. about 1900 BC, conquered the whole sea coast of India, beyond the Ganges to the Eastern Ocean. He is also said to have included the Cyclades and a great part of Europe in his conquest. Secondly, the Amarna letters found in the government offices of the Egyptian king Ignatan testify to the fact that the Egyptian Empire had extended to Western Asia, Syria, and Palestine, and that for centuries Egyptian power had been supreme in the ancient world. This was in the 18th dynasty, i.e. about 1500 BC. We are also told that during the reign of Tutmosis III, the dominion of Egypt extended not only along the coast of Palestine, but also from Nubia to northern Asia. Breadstead's Conquest of Civilization, page 84. Diodorus, page 128. Manetho, Strabo, Dicarichus, John Kendrick's Ancient Egypt, volume 1. 2. The authorship of the individual doctrines is extremely doubtful. As one attempts to read the history of Greek philosophy, one discovers a complete absence of essential information concerning the early life and training of the so-called Greek philosophers, from Thales to Aristotle. No writer or historian professes to know anything about their early education. All they tell us about them consist of A. A doubtful date and place of birth and B. Their doctrines but the world is left to wonder who they were and from what source they got their early education and would naturally expect that men who rose to the position of a teacher among relatives, friends, and associates would be well known not only by them but by the whole community. On the contrary, men who might well be placed among the earliest teachers in history 
who had grown up from childhood to manhood and had taught pupils are represented as unknown being without any domestic social or early educational traces this is unbelievable and yet it is a fact that the history of Greek philosophy has presented to the world a number of men whose lives it knows little or nothing about but expects the world to accept them as the true authors of the doctrines which are allowed to be theirs in the absence of essential evidence the world hesitates to recognize them as such because the truth of this whole matter of Greek philosophy points to a very different direction the book on nature entitled Peri Physios was the common name under which Greek students interested in nature study wrote the earliest copy is said to date back to the 6th century BC and it is customary to refer to the remnants of Peri Physios as the fragments William Turner's history of philosophy page 62 we do not believe that genuine initiates produced the book on nature since this was contrary to the rules of the Egyptian mysteries in connection with which the philosophical schools conducted their work Egypt was the center of the body of ancient wisdom and knowledge religious philosophical and scientific spread to other lands through student initiates such teachings remained for generations and centuries in the form of tradition under the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great and the movement of Aristotle and his school to compile Egyptian teaching and claim it as Greek philosophy Ancient Mysteries by C. H. Vale, page 16. Consequently, as a source of authority of authorships, Peri Physios is of little value, if any, since history mentions only four names as authors of it namely, Anaximander, Heraclitus, Parmenides. Anaxagoras and asked the world to accept their authorship of philosophy because Theophrastus, Sextus, Proclus, and Simplicius of the school at Alexandria are said to have preserved small remnants of it, the fragments. If Periphysios is the criterion to the authorship of Greek philosophy, then it falls short in its purpose by a long way since only four philosophers are allowed alleged to have written this book and to have remnants of their work according to this idea all the other philosophers who failed to write periphysios and to have remnants of it also failed to write Greek philosophy this is the reductio ad absurdum to which Peri Physios leads us. The schools of philosophy, Chaldean, Greek, and Persian, were part of the ancient mystery system of Egypt. They were conducted in secrecy, according to the demands of the Osirica, whose teachings became common to all the schools. In keeping with the demands for secrecy, the writing and publication of teachings was strictly forbidden, and consequently, initiates who had developed satisfactorily in their training and had been advanced to the rank of master or teacher refrained from publishing the teachings or philosophy. Consequently, publication of philosophy could not have come from the pen of the original philosophers themselves 
but either from their close friends who knew their views, as in the case of Pythagoras and Socrates, or from interested persons who made a record of those philosophical teachings that had become popular opinion and tradition. There is no wonder then that in the absence of original authorship, history has had to resort to the strategy of accepting Aristotle's opinion as the sole authority in determining the authorship of Greek philosophy. Introduction to Alfred Weber's History of Philosophy It is for these reasons that great doubt surrounds the so-called Greek authorship of philosophy. William Turner's History of Philosophy, pages 35, 39, 47, 53, 62, 79, 210 and 11, 627. Ancient Mysteries by C. H. Vail, page 16. Theophrastus, fragment 2. Introduction to Alfred Weber's History of Philosophy. 3. The chronology of Greek philosophers is mere speculation. History knows nothing about the early life and training of the Greek philosophers, and thus it's true not only of the pre-Socratic philosophers, but also of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, who appear in history about the age of 18 and begin to teach at 40. As a body of men, they were undesirable to the state. Persane non grata, and were consequently persecuted and driven into hiding and secrecy. Under such circumstances, they kept no records of their activities, and this was done in order to conceal their identity. After the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great, and the seizure and looting of the royal library at Alexandria, Aristotle's plan to usurp Egyptian philosophy was subsequently carried out by members of his school, Theophrastus, Andronicus of Rhodes, and Eudemus, who soon found themselves confronted with the problem of a chronology for a history of philosophy. Introduction of Zeller's History page 13. Throughout this effort there has been much speculation concerning the date of birth of philosophers whom the public knew very little about. As early as the 3rd century BC 274 to 194 BC Erastenes a Stoic drew up a chronology of Greek philosophers, and in the 2nd century BC, 140, Apollodorus also drew up another. The effort continued, and in the 1st century BC, 60 to 70 BC, Andronicus, the 11th head of the Peripatetic school, also drew up another. This difficulty continued throughout the early centuries, and has come down to the present time, for it appears that all modern writers on Greek philosophy are unable to agree on the dates that should be assigned to the nativity of the philosophers. The only exception appears to occur with reference to the three Athenian philosophers, i.e., Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. The date of whose nativity is believed to be certain, and concerning which there is general agreement among historians. However, when we come to deal with the pre-Socratic philosophers, 
we are confronted with confusion and uncertainty. And a few examples would serve to illustrate the untrustworthy nature, nature of the chronology of Greek philosophers. 1. Diogenes Laertes places the birth of Thales at 640 BC, while William Turner's History of Philosophy places it at 620 BC, that of Frank Thilly at 624 BC, that of A.K. Rogers at early in the 6th century BC, and that of W.G. Tenement at 600 BC. 2. Diogenes Laertes places the birth of Anaximenes at 546 BC, while W. Wendelbrand places it at century BC, that of Frank Thilly at 588 BC, that of B. D. Alexander at 560 BC, while that of A. K. Rogers at the 6th century BC. 3. Parmenides is credited by Diogenes as being born at 500 BC, while Fuller, Thilly, and Rogers omit a date of birth because they say it is unknown. 4. Zeller places the birth of Xenophanes at 576 BC, while Diogenes gives 570 BC, and the majority of the other historians declare that the date of birth is unknown. 5. With reference to Zeno, Diogenes, who does not know the date of his birth, says that he flourished between B.C. 464 to 460, while William Turner places it at 490 B.C. Like Frank Thilly and B.D. Alexander, while Fuller, A.K. Rogers, and W.G. Tenorman declare it as unknown. 6. With references to Heraclitus, Zeller makes the following suppositions. If he died in 475 BC, and if he was 60 years old when he died, then he must have been born in 535 BC. Similarly, Diogenes supposed that he flourished between 504 and 500. And while William Turner places his birth at 530 BC, Wendell Brand places it at 536 BC, and Fuller and Tenemann declare that he flourished in 500 BC. 7. With reference to Pythagoras, Zeller, who does not know the date of his birth, supposes that it occurred between the years 580 and 570 BC. And while Diogenes also supports that it occurred between the years 582 and 500 BC, William Turner, Fuller, Rogers, and Tenemann declare that it is unknown. With reference to Empedocles, while Diogenes places his birth at 484 BC, Turner, Wendell Brand, Fuller, B.D. Alexander, and Tenemann place it at 490 BC, while A.K. Rogers and others declare it as unknown. 10. With reference to Leucippus, all historians seem to be of the opinion 
that he has never existed. 11. Socrates, 469 to 399 BC. Plato, 427, 347 BC. And Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC. Are the only three philosophers, the dates of whose nativity and death do not seem to have led to speculation among historians. But the reason for this uniformity is probably due to the fact that they were Athenians and had been indicted by the Athenian government who would naturally have investigated them and kept a record of their cases. A. K. Rogers History of Philosophy page 104 It must be noted from the preceding comparative study of the chronology of Greek philosophers that A. The variation in dates points to speculation B. The pre-Socratic philosophers were unknown because they were foreigners to the Athenian government and probably never existed. C. It follows that both the pre-Socratic Socratic philosophers together with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were persecuted by the Athenian government for introducing foreign doctrines doctrines into Athens. D. In consequence of these facts, any subsequent claim by the Greeks to the ownership or authorship of these same doctrines, which they had rejected and persecuted, must be regarded as a usurpation. 4. The Compilation of the history of Greek philosophy was the plan of Aristotle executed by his school. When Aristotle decided to compile a history of Greek philosophy, he must have made known his wishes to his pupils Theophrastus and Eudemus. For no sooner did he produce his metaphysics then Theophrastus followed him by publishing 18 books on the doctrines of the phys physicists. Similarly, after Theophrastus had published his doctrines of the physicists, Eudemus produced separate histories of arithmetic, geometry, astrology, and also theology. This was an amazing start because of the large number of scientific books and the wide range of subjects treated. This situation was rightly aroused <clears throat> the suspicion, suspicion of the world as it questions the source of these scientific works. Since Theophrastus and Eudemus were students under Aristotle at the same time, and since the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great made the Egyptian library at Alexandria available to the Greeks for research, then it must be expected that the three men, Aristotle, who was a close friend of Alexander, Theophrastus, and Eudemus, not only did research at the Alexandrian library at the same time, but must also have helped themselves to books, which enabled them to follow each other so closely in the production of scientific works. William Turner's History of Philosophy, page 158-159, which were either a portion of the war booty taken from the library or compilations from them. Note that Aristotle's works reveal the signs of note-taking and that Theophrastus and Eudemus were pupils attending Aristotle's school at the same time. 
William Turner's History of Philosophy, page 127. Just here, it might be as well to mention the names of Aristotle's pupils who took an active part in promoting the movement toward the compilation of a history of Greek philosophy. A. Theophrastus of Lesbos, 371-286 BC, who succeeded Aristotle as head of the Peripatetic School. As elsewhere mentioned, he is said to have produced 18 books on the doctrines of physicists. Who are these physicists? Greek or Egyptians? Just think of it. B. Eudemus of Rhodes, a contemporary of Theophrastus, with whom he also attended Aristotle's school. He is said to have produced histories of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and theology, as elsewhere mentioned. What was the source of the data of the histories of these sciences, which must have taken any nation thousands of years to develop, Greece or Egypt? Just think of it. C. Andronicus of Rhodes, an eclectic of Aristotle's school and editor of his works, 70 B.C. These men's works, together with Aristotle's metaphysics, which contained a critical summary of the doctrines of all preceding philosophers, seem to form the nucleus of a compilation of what has been called the history of Greek philosophy. Zeller's History of Greek Philosophy, Introduction, pages 7 to 14. The next movement was the organization of an association called the Learned Study of Aristotle's Writings, whose members were Theophrastus and Andronicus, who were both closely connected with the school of Aristotle. The function of this association was to identify the literature and doctrines of philosophy with their so-called respective authors, and in order to accomplish this, the alumni of Aristotle's school and its friends were encouraged to enter upon a research for Aristotle's works and to write commentaries on them. In addition to this, the learned association also encouraged research for the recovery of what has been named fragments or remnants of a book, which is supposed to have once existed and to have borne the common title Periphysios, i.e. concerning nature. Here again, those who went out in search of Periphysios or its remnants were the alumni of Aristotle's school and its friends, but their efforts to establish authorship was a failure. A. Theophrastus found only two lines of Periphysios, supposed to have been written by Anaximander. B. Sextus and Proclus of the 5th century AD and Simplicius of the 6th century AD are said to have found a copy of Periphysios, supposed to have been produced by Parmenides. C. In addition, the name of Simplicius is also associated with a copy of Periphysios, which is supposed to have been produced by Anaxagoras. So much for Periphysios and the fragments, and so much for the attempt of the learned association. For the study of Aristotle's works, which has failed because of lack of evidence, as has elsewhere been pointed out. The recovery of two copies and two lines of Periphysios is not proof that all Greek philosophers wrote Periphysios, or even that the names assigned to them were their bona fide authors. It certainly would appear that the object of the learned association was to beat Aristotle's own drum and dance. It was Aristotle's idea to compile a history of philosophy. 
and it was out of style of school and its alumni that carried out the idea. We are told. End of chapter one.